If you didn't hear the news, little Benjamin Phillips hit the ground running on Monday night. He came two days early, and um, he is not a ginger. Who knew? He has olive skin and brown hair, and what's going on? I don't know. It's a miracle. It's, um, and, uh, but they are doing so well. Fee looks amazing. Gabe looks shattered. Um, but uh, I went to see them on Friday. He's not weathering it as well as Fee. But they're having fun. And that's the main thing. And God's been incredibly kind. I, I mean, I'm, I'm struggling with the fact he's not called Mark. Um, I don't know if I should. or, but, but I'm sure God's in the process somewhere. Anyway, too much messing around. I'm excited for tonight. Can I pray for us? Is that good? Jesus, Holy Spirit, Father, we come tonight. I pray, Holy Spirit, tonight as we read your word, as your word is preached, I pray, show us, Jesus, the greatest result that I could ever ask for tonight as I preach and endeavor to preach your word tonight is that men and women would see Jesus more. I pray as I preach, show me Jesus more, God. In everything, show us Jesus and have your way with us tonight, mighty King. Amen. So we're in the series called The New Way. It's a series on the book of, of Colossians where we're looking at this man, Paul, an apostle, is sitting in prison and he's writing a letter to a bunch of free people out there and he's writing about their freedom. He's calling them to life. He's fighting for the truth of the gospel and he chooses to just write a letter with four chapters. Every single line of those chapters is full of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is pure, unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ. Every single line. And it's all about the preeminence, the power, the perfection of Jesus Christ. And if anyone would hold on to him and him alone, there's some challenges, there's some pressures to the people in Colossae. And they're being called to worship other gods and put Jesus as part of their God package. And they're being called to fall under some laws and making up these laws to fall. And they're saying, he's saying, no, guys, I'm sitting in prison. But I, tell, I want to tell you, there's a greater freedom. There is a greater life. His name is Jesus. He is supreme above all things. We don't have a sin problem. We don't have an apathy problem. We don't have an addiction problem. We have a supremacy problem. And when Jesus becomes supreme in our stories... His peace comes, His order comes, His life comes to everything. And so that's the book we're in. It's incredible. Tonight, I want to jump ahead a little bit as this amazing man spends a whole chapter one speaking about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And then he continues to carry on in chapter two. He speaks about the sufficiency of what it means to walk with Jesus as supreme in our life. He positions it that way. In chapter three, he changes tack a little bit. He spends Three verses talking about our identity in Christ again, which he's done in chapter 1. He does it again in chapter 2, and he speaks about our identity in Christ, and then he calls it to what it means to represent. I mean, in the old days, it would be like a gangster, you go, represent. Some of you aren't as hip, as lit, as me, or is it drip? Drip. I got taught to new a drip. Nathan told me last night my jeans were drip. I don't know what drip is. Overflowing, apparently. That's how it got explained to me. But before I read the scripture, I, actually, let's read the scripture. I feel like that's essential tonight. Verse, chapter 1, Colossians 3. Let's read together. We'll put it on the screen. If you have your Bible, you can read with me. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also be with Him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, ra rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of, of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in, is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgive one another if any of you has any grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. 
and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in all your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in all the na- it, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. I haven't struggled to read a section of Scripture so much in a couple of years. I don't know what's happening there. I'm excited for tonight. Come on. Thank you, Brett. Yesterday morning, we decided to sleep in a bit, which if you're in my house, means 6 o'clock. So you're just enjoying a sleep in. But it was horrendous because at about 10 past 6, we had three rhinos into our house. True story. Rhinos just bashing everything around. I just heard next minute wife and I would hear, ba, ba, ba. We're like, what is going on? So I did the honorable thing and asked my wife to go downstairs to see what was happening. <laughs> Obviously, that's the right thing to do. To which I realized it wasn't rhinos at all. It wasn't wild animals. It wasn't um, invaders from another land. Just three boys called Judah, Ben, and Daniel. Just three little boys making a noise you cannot believe. And what they were doing is they were standing on a piece of furniture we have next to our TV and decided to make an obstacle course because they'd been watching obstacle courses on TV. And they decided to jump from this piece of furniture which was about this high onto my lazy boy. <laughs> Did I say that right? My lazy boy. Let me say it one more time because my lazy boy, they are jumping Onto the lazy ball. It is smashing against the back wall. It sounds like rhinos have entered our house. Then they are running all around. And they have gone absolutely off their minds. They weren't acting like little fun and boys. Obviously. They had gone nuts. They weren't representing our household in that moment. It's like they had become something else. Their identity had changed. They turned into wild animals. Chimpanzees swinging from tree to tree. It's like they totally forgotten who they were, and in forgetting who they were, they were doing what we don't do as Van Pletsens. We don't climb furniture and jump across four feet of tiles to land on a lazy boy that is precious to dad. We don't do that. See, there was an identity issue going on in my children because they thought they'd become chimpanzees and would go wild, and then there was a a resultant representing issue because we don't do that. It's a simple conversation. We don't do that. See, sometimes in our houses we get identities, and and when you get an identity, there's a resultant representation to that identity. Some families, I I was saying, in some families it would sit down and and pray. It's not just a normal prayer. In Lee's house, obviously being a psalmist, a singer, a a, a lover of worship, they sit down and they, they don't sing like, thank you, Father, for our food. It's like, Thank you, Father, for, I mean, to be a part of the lovey household, you've got to serenade, like prayer. It's not even just, this is grace, but we're going to sing it, because he's representing the family. Am I right, Lee? Obviously. Represent. You don't just, in my house, to represent means you don't jump or furniture onto other furniture to turn other furniture into obstacle courses you can destroy a house at six in the morning. There was a representative issue, but the challenges Paul is writing in the scripture is saying, guys, there's this identity in Christ. In verses 1 to 4, he deals with our identity in Christ, and then he starts jumping into big things like sexual immorality and anger and malice and rage, and he says, that's not representing what Jesus has done. But he takes the whole of chapter 1, the whole of chapter 2, and the start of chapter 3, presenting Jesus the whole way. And then he doesn't say, don't do this, don't do this. He says, just guys, that's not representing. And sometimes we have those conversations in houses. I'm realizing I'm having to have them often because I kind of think with my kids just being around, obviously, their whole life in my house, they get it. But they don't always get it. They don't always know what it is to represent in this house. There's some things, as fun persons, we do and we don't do. And some of those things are underpinned by a whole bunch of things called identity. And there's a whole bunch of things in our world that's looking to establish identities in you and I. Our culture is looking to establish identities in us that would maybe take us on different voices, maybe different journeys to what a Jesus identity would. 
there's our career. And I've seen people who've walked lines and worship Jesus line get into a career and how a career can totally sidetrack and like, you become a different person. Anyone else seen that? Or is it just me? It's like, wow, at the knees of success and at the knees of things that God has given and good things, we become something else and we start representing almost a different household. Paul's dealing with that. He's saying peer groups and status and, 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 and our past, our past that starts dictating what our future should look like. There is an issue, and Paul addresses it, says, in everything and all things, he's writing this book to the believers. He's not writing this to the world. He's writing this to the believers of Jesus Christ in a place called Colossae. So he writes, like he writes to us in Cape Town, at this time, I need you to get your identity in Jesus so that you can represent him to a world that's desperately, desperately, desperately looking for him. They're not looking for the church on how to do meetings and where should you place lights and what harmony should we sing. They're looking for something that this world cannot offer. The supreme one, Jesus. And he starts out in verse 1, he says, with Christ. In verse 1, where Christ. In verse 3, with Christ. In verse 4, when Christ. And verse 4, again, with Christ. A couple of points tonight in our identity that Paul lays out, and we're speaking about a new way. I want to speak about some of the new things we get in Jesus. Number one, we get a new starting point. And he says this in verse one, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. I don't know about you. I don't wake up every morning feeling raised to life. Everyone, like some of you morning people, weird morning people. You like wake up, it's like you've literally been raised from the dead. I'm raised to life. I feel it. I don't know about you, but I don't feel that every morning. Paul's writing to us and he says, there's a couple of things I need you to get because you're not always going to feel it. And he's writing to a world where actually Gnosticism is breaking in and people are going about, it's actually not just about Jesus and what he's done. You need to have higher knowledge. And once you've entered into the third, fourth, seventh, twelfth heaven, you'll then be fully achieved and fully, no, he's saying, guys, rubbish. I want you to get some stuff about your identity. I want you to get it deep down inside so it starts allowing you to represent. Number one, it's done. You have been raised. It's not present tense. It's not still happening. It's not one day when you are big and have gone to church 400 times and, and, and got like attendance merits. Then, no, you have been raised when? When you've been touched by the blood of Jesus. Full stop. We got to get it. We, we got to get it so deep down inside that we start living it. It's not the other way around. Everyone's trying to live it, but when you can't live it, and maybe you can live it for a day or live it for two hours or live it for three weeks, but I promise you, unless it's deep down inside in an identity issue, it's gonna, you're going to struggle to live it. And then he carries on. He says, no, guys, it's not just that. I want you to change your perspective. You get a new perspective. You, you, it says, where Christ is seated. It changes your perspective when you understand I've not just been raised from dead to life. I've been seated where Christ is seated. And that brings me a new perspective. It also brings a new power to my story and to your story. A seat of authority where Jesus is seated on the right hand of the Father. He says, you get raised with him and you get seated with him in a position of authority and power. Now, it, again, does it feel like it every day? When people, you're cutting you off in traffic and you can do nothing about it. Doesn't feel like it. When your kids have got fevers and it's going all wrong and you're going, this isn't how I planned the day. It doesn't feel like it. But Paul's saying, guys, I'm writing to you from prison. Not because someone told me to. Not because it's going to get me out of prison. I'm just writing because I'm fighting for your freedom. I'm fighting for the life that God has given to you. I'm fighting so that the church would represent him well. And I'm writing to you to tell you it's done You've got a new perspective, and there's a new power available to you. Why? Because he is seated on his throne. He's again presenting Jesus. And so the church becomes this powered up people, and he's writing. He's saying, guys, forget the fact that I'm in prison. I might be in the least power of authority in this world. It's like, what can you do from prison? It doesn't matter what it looks like on this earth. In Christ, I'm seated with him. And then he continues. He says, actually, you don't just get that. You get a new focus. He starts in verse 2. He says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. How, how do we grow? How do we move forward? If you read any leadership guy of our world or big writers or authors, they'll tell him you need focus in this life. And I would present to you that even if you think you don't have focus, you're focusing on something. 
You're moving towards something. There is a journey going on, even if it's not an intentional one. Paul is writing, he's saying, guys, I'm calling you to a focus at this time. Church in Colossae, there's a big story called the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's all in him and it's all about him. And I'm not writing to you to sort out all the issues in the church. I'm writing because there's a bigger story here. It's bigger than your broken. It says every life has focus. He's calling them that. And the Passion translates and writes that same scripture this way. It says, yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm. And fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not with the distractions of the natural realm. Ooh, Mark. Whoa. Realms. Like, I'm not that deep a Christian. And the heavenly realm and the earthly realm. And no, the day you were touched by the blood of Jesus, you become alive to the fact that there are the realms of heaven and there's the realm of earth. And that's why I pray to a Father in heaven because I art on earth. And we become alive to these things and to stay ignorant of those things is to deny the authority that he's called us to carry in those realms and to understand that there's battles going on in those realms. What do I mean? What does that impact? Well, I would say that all earthly things, he says, take your eyes off earthly things because earthly things keep bringing us down to earth and keep getting us smaller. A focus on more money in your life won't bring you to a bigger world. It'll make you smaller, I promise you. A focus on, I'm just going to focus on my kids, my relationship, my, my dynamics, and my selfish word. All that does is makes my world smaller. But when I focus on Jesus, it pulls me into salvation, which comes from the root word yasa, which means a spacious place. The essence of salvation is a spaciousness that comes to every part of our world. It's a spiritual thing. It's a heavenly realms thing. We get pulled into it. Why? Because of eyes fixed on Jesus. Oh, Mark, you've been saying this for weeks, and it's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Yes, it's Jesus, Jesus. There's nothing else. There's nothing else. It's all we have, church, is Jesus. Oh, but it's glorious, and he is glorious. But it's an amazing thing. I don't know how many of you have ever made concrete. Any concrete mixes in the house? I've tried it a few times, got it right once or twice. It's hard to get it good. And so you keep mixing and you chuck the concrete powder and there's water and you add water and you mix. But if you want to keep using that concrete, you keep adding water. And as long as you're adding water before it sets, it's okay. And you can pull your foot out. Obviously, this never happened to me as a child. And, and, but there comes a time when your foot's in there and it sets. Just hypothetically, obviously. And, um, and, and, and then you realize that trying to add water after it's set doesn't help. It doesn't bring your foot out. It doesn't set you free. You have to take a hammer, theoretically, to that concrete and break your foot out. What does he say? He says, set. Set your mind. It means, actually, you can add water so long, you can kind of keep it loose, and you can try to figure it out, but there's got to come a moment as a believer where you have to set your mind on Jesus means nothing else you add, nothing that can be thrown into the mix, nothing that comes on top of that, unless it is a big heavy brick that breaks it apart. Nothing that comes into the story can break off the truth that Jesus is the cornerstone. Jesus is the everything. Jesus is everything. He says, church, I'm sitting in prison. They're not feeding me very well. It's not super comfortable. This isn't where I want to be, but I promise you Jesus is worth it. I'm calling you to set your mind on Jesus. Fix your gaze on Jesus. It's an incredible challenge, and I, I love it from Hebrews 12. We get all the, 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 the fathers of our faith, and they call us their stories. It says, therefore, since you are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders. Just throw it off. Throw it off. And the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marks out for us. How? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author, the perfecter, the pioneer of our faith. It's the only way. Oh, someone gave me 12 steps at church. And if I wake up at quarter to six earlier than the guy next door and I just pray for 10 minutes. And then if I just don't eat something and then I, no, rubbish. Rubbish. Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Allow his kingship to come upon your life. And the starting point of healing and wholeness is look at him. And the continuation of that freedom is look at him. And the life that he wants to give is just fix your eyes on him. The decisions the world cannot help with, and you don't know where to go. Look at him. 
The Apostle Paul carries on in verse 3. He says, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Number three, in this new life, we get a new story. He says, You died. Say after me, I'm dead. That's what Paul's saying. He says, You died. Dead, dead, dead. You are dead. And then Jesus breaks in. And the mystery of the gospel and the mystery of his blood and the, the beauty of his perfection and all things says, Now I'm not just going to bring you to life, I'm going to hide you in Christ. Oh. And to get to you, they've got to get through me. I'm going to bring you alive, but I'm not just going to bring you up to be the same. I'm going to hide you in Jesus. See, here's the first truth. We are dead men and women walking, but alive in Christ and alive to the things of heaven that we were never alive to before. That's why heavenly realms become a thing. George Muller, who was an incredible evangelist and caretaker of over 10,000 orphans, someone asked him, well, where did it all start? And what was the power and what was the reality of your life? And he said this, he said, there came a day where George Muller died, died to his wants, died to his desires, and died to his wishes. And Christ came alive. I would love my story to say I helped 10,000 orphans. I'd love my story to say I helped one. But there's got to come a day when we realize that in Christ, the apostle saying you've died and you come alive. And not just come alive, but there's this, this, this challenge. What do we die to? Well, there are things to die to. Before I tell you what we get saved and you get died to people's opinions. Die to it. Let that thing die. Let possessions and, and popularity and all the things that hold and your past. And the challenge is sometimes we get nervous and we start trying to chuck water in the setting concrete. So we start trying to resuscitate some of these things in our lives. says, no, leave it behind. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Repentance is not this, oh, I've got to break that off me. Repentance is just putting your eyes on Jesus and it falls off. That's what happens. It's a changing, a fixing an eyes, a setting my gaze upon Jesus, turning 180 degrees and saying, there's something better. His name is Jesus. And to fully grasp that we have been raised is to see him raised. And I love that promise that it's not just raised to life. He's raised and hidden us in Christ. We are secure in Christ. See, people hide things for many reasons. Sometimes we hide things because of embarrassment. We hide facts about our lives, stories from our life, just in case they would embarrass. But I think sometimes we hide the most precious things in our life. Michael spoke last week about a wedding ring that got an engagement ring that got hidden by his friend. Why? Because it was precious. Had very similar stories, actually. And um, you hide precious things. And the Apostle Paul's right and says, guys, I'm in prison. I'm in chains. Life isn't dandy right now, but you know what? I'm hidden in Jesus, and so are you. And your chaos in the world that's going on around you and the uncertainty and the insecurity in your story, you're hidden in Christ. He's working our identity so that when the storms come, we represent as sons and daughters who are hidden in Jesus. I think it's an incredible, incredible truth. Then it says in verse 4, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear to Him in glory. See, we get hidden, but He puts us inside of Him. And the only reason we have a heartbeat, and the only reason there is life, and the only reason there is hope is because we're in close to His heart. And when I start spending time with him, when I start laying my head on his chest like the Apostle John, when I start pushing into him, I start feeling the heartbeat of heaven. It's the heartbeat of Jesus. It's the life. He says, when Christ, who is your life? And it starts becoming the very life rod of our stories. Is the life of Jesus in our story. He says, then you will also appear with me in glory. What, I want to ask you a question. What brings you to life? What makes you come alive? What makes you come alive for Liverpool fans? It's very easy. They're all on Facebook at quarter to 12 at night wearing red shirts going bad selfies. Go to sleep, man. For surfers, it's, it's these crazy waves. and they're, like, they're driving past the ocean, turning left, but they're not even going to the beach. 
It's photographers, it's early morning sunrises, for coffee addicts, it's the perfect bean made just the right way. For a dancer, it's when the beat drops. There are things in our lives that bring us to life. And Paul's speaking to that thing. He says, guys, I want you to know, and he obviously, he has his motto in Philippians, and he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We obviously know that Paul was Scottish as well, so for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Obviously, because Paul was Scottish, if you didn't know that, um, search Google. But he says, guys, too many are living like this. Like for me to live is money, and to die is, you reckon? Yeah. It's for, to live his fame, to live his power. And he says, guys, I'm sitting in prison and I'm writing to encourage you for me to live as Christ. And I don't just live in him, his name at a distance. I'm pulled into him. I'm placed near to his heart so that his very heartbeat brings life to me. In the midst of the storm, it's not the waves that rage or the winds that blow. It's the heartbeat of heaven that I know is close to me. And I can hold on. You see this identity issue that rages. People are going, do I have a future? Do I have a story? Do I have all these things? And we keep making these statements about, oh, my, the glory days are behind us. And I go to my 20th school reunion, and guys are still talking about that try he scored in the left corner of Van Heerden's Field in Durban. I'm like, get over it. Tell another story. Because surely if those were your glory days, what's lying ahead? Surely the best days are ahead. I love the people of the community. I, I loved walking out of church this morning I, after Milnes. I came back here. The shiniest car in our car park, a little blue Ford Fiesta that has racing mags on it. It's blinged up. It has a racing thing on the back. It's owned by Beth. And Beth is not 36. She's a little bit older, I think. She's 80. 81. The, I'm being corrected by, thank you. She's 81. She still leads exercise classes. She still leads a life group. She still has a zest for life that challenges me, and she drives the zootiest car in the church. I'm going, I want to be like Beth. I'm just being honest. I saw that car like, my glory days are ahead of me. Thank you, Bez. It's, 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 we tell stories of our past, and my glory days are ahead of me. Why? Because there's a promise in who Jesus is and who's coming back. That's why we get stoked when we sing the old hymns. And we start singing, When Christ shall come with shouts of acclamation, and our hearts begin to soar and we begin pulled into a bigger story. It's because there's a revelation that in His glorification, when He rises, I rise. And though I might be down today, there will be a day that is coming where He will rise and I will rise with Him. Why? Because I'm hidden in Him. And you've got to get through Him to get to me. And man will try to get his hands on you. And circumstances will try to get their hands on you. And everything will try to get their hands on you. But there's only one fingerprint that determines my life and my identity and who I will represent. It is the blood of Jesus. And Paul's preaching from a prison. He's saying, guys, I need you to get this. I need you to get it to a point that you get it. That it's not emotions and whether you wake up feeling risen or not. That you know we are believers. And what we believe is important because right believing determines right living. It doesn't happen the other way around. Well, if I just live it, I'll eventually believe it. No, orthodoxy leads to orthopraxy, which means that right believing leads us to right living. And I love the fact that only then he starts to say, okay, now, I'm going to call you to represent. He's worked so hard on their identity. See, because too often we call people to standards that we can't call them to because they don't know who they are. My five-year-old, my eight-year-old, my ten-year-old, I can keep calling them to things, but they're still on a journey of finding out who they are. I have to have grace for that. There's age-appropriate parenting, and parenting is the toughest thing in the world. As their little emotions are going through all sorts of things, and I'm watching a ten-year-old navigate exams and pressures and competition and a whole bunch of things, and I realize he's still on a journey of finding out who he is, and part of my job as a father is to keep that journey alive and keep that journey focused on one, and it's not me, it's Jesus. But if I do that, one day he'll rise with Jesus, and he says, guys, now the journey starts, so he goes big. 
Paul's not one to mess around. He's Scottish. Obviously. He is. And he just goes, he says, guys, all that stuff, risen in Christ, all that stuff, hidden in Jesus. Now I'm going to call you something. And this is how he starts. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. See, we don't always like talking about sin. We don't always call it what it is. We sometimes like to, well, as long as I've got more Jesus, I can manage this amount of sin. But it's not the truth. And if we believe the Bible, and if we believe Paul was a gift given to the church, a man who stepped away from so much and into a story in the midst of a prison, he's fighting for you and I. He says this amazing statement, put to death. Now, I'm not a hunter, never shot anything with a bow, a gun, or anything. But one day, I was playing golf in Durban. Dangerous sport, golf. Picked up my driver. 16th hole, Royal Durban, narrow fairway. Hits it as hard as I could, and the ball flew. Began to draw. Missed the fairway. And landed on the neck of a heron. Didn't hit the ground first. Didn't touch and hit the neck of a heron. And I thought, that's tickets. So now we walk up there, and I'm, I'm devastated. I'm like one who raised this thing from the dead. Not quite sure. If you're an animal lover, just stay with me. Just breathe. Just go like this. It's okay. It's part of the natural process. But I get there. It's not dead. It's attempting. Its neck is broken because the ball hits it on the neck. Its head is hanging down, and it's attempting to walk around. Now, my mate, Kent. Not quite sure what he did when he worked in the Middle East. Afterwards, I was convinced he was an assassin because he said, we can't leave it like this. I'm like, what do you want me to do? I can't do anything. I'm devastated. This is ruining my round. So my mate Kent takes responsibility because I chickened out and I just wasn't keen. He takes a 7-iron. I remember it was a 7-iron. And the course was a bit waterlogged. And he takes a seven iron. Some of stay with me, it's okay, it's a good story. And he he begins to drown this animal because its neck is broken. Its body's trying to walk. And he drowns this animal. He puts it to death. Yes, you're all going like this. It's what the apostle Paul says we need to do in our lives with sin. He says, Don't play with it. Don't entertain it. Stop trying to keep raising it from the dead. Put it to death. Let it die. Fix your eyes on Jesus. See, I could stand here and speak to you about sexual morality. You know. I can give you the terminology and the definitions. And we will. We will speak and we do speak. But sin is not a game. And the Apostle Paul works chapter 1, chapter 2. He takes these four incredible scriptures of chapter 3. And he just makes an incredible statement. Put to death. Why? Because inside of you, actually inside of Jesus, there's a life that is glorious. It's a life that can change this world. It's a life that this world is looking for. And in that life, there's something more glorious than the effects of what you are putting to death. The life of Jesus, the potential. The world won't understand sometimes, and I'm looking at young people, you're going to make decisions. I promise you, the world won't get it. Your friends won't get it. It's not going to make sense to people. My encouragement to you is this, get over it. Because to be a disciple of Jesus doesn't mean you're going to win a popularity contest. To follow Jesus is to make the decisions that the world won't understand, that the appetites of your flesh, that their flesh wants it. The appetite of a flesh is going to cry out for it. The Bible says, and the Apostle Paul writes, put it to death. And your body's going, no, but I like it. And as parents, we try to start saying, oh, it's not lacquer. No, you're lying. But the journey is there's something better. It's called Jesus. Live for Jesus. Live to please Jesus. Put to death. It's a radical story, I know. See, our sinful nature craves the brokenness of this world. Craves it. Like an addict running after it. I don't know if you've ever been in the presence of an addict who's trying to come off his addiction to something like cocaine or heroin. 
Brick walls won't stop him. Parents' furniture won't stop him. Cars of friends, they don't stop them. The Bible says put it to death. And the only way you put it to death, fix your eyes. Set your eyes on Jesus. See, and this is the order. This is what Christ has done. So this is who you are because this is who he is. Now live. In Jesus, we get a new starting point. We get a new focus. We get a new story. We get a new future. And there's a new death. Maybe if I could just have Lee up or piano up, if that's cool. I want to land here because if we read Colossians, anything other than the appeal of a man, a man who was the worst of legalists, the worst of sinners, the best in his field, sitting in chains, and he's writing for your freedom and my freedom. If we don't see it as that, we miss the beauty of the gospel. Won't you stand with me tonight? All I'm doing is line upon line trying to preach the word of God. Bring it alive to you. I trust you are finding the word for yourself. But as we leave this place, I don't want to leave us unchanged or an ability to respond. There's a prayer we've prayed every week that I've preached. It's a prayer of my will. It's a prayer of submission. It's a prayer of desire. It's a prayer of love. It's a prayer of trust. And it's just this, Jesus be my Lord. Jesus be my King. Jesus be my everything. It's a radical prayer. Don't get me wrong. Because to live it out and to fully live it out, it's going to demand some things like put to death. But hold on and know that you are close to the heartbeat of heaven, the Savior of the world. So could we close our eyes and maybe you could pray that prayer with me. Will you pray, Jesus be my Lord. Jesus be my King. Jesus be my everything. So we're going to get a little bit more excited with that prayer. And we're going to say, Jesus, be my Lord. Jesus, be my King. Jesus, be my everything. I pray, Spirit of God, as you're in this place, we want to see Jesus. My preaching will never, never do the full job, but you, Lord, you can show us Jesus. And I pray where there's hunger and thirst in this room and every heart, I pray, show us Jesus, King. While we stand here, some of us have got to put to death some things. You know it. You don't need me to read the list again. You know. You know. And I'm telling you this, you can't do it out of your own will or desire. You can only do it by fixing your eyes on Jesus. The weapon... You put the brokenness of our lives to death is purely by fixing your eyes on Jesus. And His grace begins to operate. His grace begins to pour out, begins to reveal, begins to show. And freedom starts to become a currency. Freedom starts to become the flow that's in our veins. It's Jesus. What do you need to put to death? That wasn't the focus of my preach, but I want to tell you, I think it's what God wants to do. Before we leave, I want you to answer to yourself, to no one else, what do you need to put to death tonight? What are the the mountains, the cycles in your life that are holding you back? What do you need to put to death? And then trust in the first step towards the freedom. There's Jesus. There's life. There's liberty. And louder than any other voice, voice of lies, the voice of your past, maybe even the voice of your broken present, louder than all of that. I pray, God, would we hear Jesus? Would we see Jesus? Would you show us Jesus? We worship you, King. We honor you, Jesus. Thank you for your word. We read it like no other, God. Show us Jesus.
Can we pray that one more time? Jesus, be my Lord. Jesus, be my King. Jesus, be my everything. Amen.